listen to us. Because we are so imperfect, and yet we rejoice that somehow you could be so gracious and forgiving that we could ultimately be your children. We thank you for that marvelous blessing that is ours. Father, tonight we're grateful for the church wherever it exists. And we're thankful that the church is growing in many places where just a few short years ago it did not even exist. Father, we ask your kindest blessings to be upon those new Christians who are struggling to grow in the knowledge of your word and, and to grow in service to you. And we pray for those children of yours who are serving in difficult places, who are fighting against foes that we're not familiar with here. Father, we're grateful for the multitude of blessings that you shower upon us every day, but especially for the blessings of this very moment. We thank you that we can be a part of this assembly here tonight, that we can study from your word together, and that we can be encouraged by the fellowship of one another and by the knowledge that you are here among us. Father, we pray your blessings upon Brother Claiborne as he directs our study tonight. We're thankful that we can truly study from your word and that it is so readily accessible to each one of us. And that as we read and study from your word, we can have that great assurance that it is truly inspired by you, that it is without error, and that it is to be our sole guide from heaven or from earth all the way to heaven. Father, we ask your blessings upon the activities of this lectureship throughout the week. We pray for each one who will be directing our minds. We pray for each one in attendance that we'll be diligent in our study, that we'll be faithful in the application of thy word to our lives. Help us to take very seriously the responsibilities that are ours as a people that belong to you. We rejoice tonight that we are your children, and we give you our thanks in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Please turn to number 673, which will be the song of encouragement following Brother Claiborne's lesson. Again, it is such a great privilege to introduce to you our brother in Christ, a great gospel preacher, Brother Winford Clayton. When Brother Maxey announced 1926 is my birth, I suspect you thought I'd have trouble getting up here tonight. That's a long time ago. But I am grateful to be here and to be at this lectureship. Although I had not had the privilege of attending this lectureship before, I have benefited tremendously from it. Through the years, I have purchased the volumes that you have prepared, and I think they are among the best that our brethren have published, and I say that sincerely. There are some disadvantages to flying. One of them is when you get where you're going, you seldom have wheels. But Brother Tex Hamilton took care of that yesterday. He picked us up at the airport and brought us to the place where we are staying. Brian and Dana Kidd and their beautiful little daughter and excellent little dog are entertaining us. And we are privileged to be in their home. When Brother Maxie called and invited me to the lectureship, I thought it would be an opportunity to come and see if I could get Molly Evans fired. Do you know who Molly Evans is? Do you support her? She wrote an article recently which appeared in our paper, The Tennessean, 
in which she said that some Christians ought to be thrown to the lions. I don't know whether she had you in mind or not. It would have been very difficult for Brother Max in the lectureship committee to have selected a topic that excites me more and challenges me more. I especially enjoy the theme that is so appropriate, especially in our day. My section of that theme is, His by reason of creation, fearfully and wonderfully made. As most of you know, secular humanism, atheism, agnosticism, and other forms of unbelief are rampant in the United States and throughout the world. I read only this week that 2% of the people in Great Britain go to church anytime, and probably fewer in Australia. We do have a great number of people in the United States who attend some form of religious worship. But in many cases, the religious groups are almost as humanistic as secular humanism. If the secular humanists, the atheists, and the agnostics are correct, that God does not exist or that he did not create man, what can be the meaning of human life and aspirations? A number of years ago, Colin Chapman wrote a book which he called Christianity on Trial. There are a number of quotations in the book I wish I had time to read to you, but I've selected just two or three. Chapman says, if there be no creator God who gives man meaning and value, one immediate reaction is to say that the question about meaning in life is itself meaningless. And one of the sad commentaries on our society is that many people see no meaning in life, no reason for living. That could be one of the reasons that teenage suicide has increased over 300% in the last 20 years. Somerset Mom, one of America's great writers, made this observation. If one puts aside the existence of God and the possibility of survival to be doubt too doubtful to have any effect on one's behavior, one has to make up one's mind what is the meaning and the use of life. If death ends it all, and if I have nothing to hope for, nothing good, and do not expect any evil, then I must ask myself, why am I here? Under these circumstances, how do I conduct myself? Now, the answer to one of these questions is plain but so unpalatable that most men will not face it. There is no reason for life, and life has no meaning. One of England's influential secular humanists was H.J. Blackman, and these are observations from a secular humanist. There is no end to hiding from the ultimate end of life, which is death. You cannot escape it. We see it on every hand. We all recognize that we're going to be part of it. But trying to hide from death does not avail. There is nothing you can do about it. On humanist assumptions, life leads to nothing. And every pretense that it does, that it does not, is a deceit. If you think life has any meaning, you simply are deceived. If there is a bridge, he says, over a gorge, which spans only half the distance and ends in midair. And if the bridge is crowded with human beings pressing on, one after another, they fall into the abyss. The bridge leads nowhere, and those who are pressing onward are going nowhere. It does not matter where they think they're going, what preparations for the journey they have made, how much they may be enjoying it all. Such a situation is a model of utility. Now, whether this explains all the immorality which exists in our country, I cannot say precisely. I believe there is a direct bearing. But living as if there is no life after death, no God, 
It seems to me to take away the motivation for our living righteously and honorably among our fellow men. The tragedy, as I see it, is not that the secular humanists, the atheists, and the agnostics take these positions. They have done so for years. In fact, if you go all the way back to New Testament times, you find men taking precisely the same position. Here is the tragedy. Theologians of all stripes in 1995 are giving aid and comfort to the enemy because they take the same position. I want to review I really want to review several, but this clock says just a few. Books that will give you an indication of the trend of modernistic theology. John Shelby Spong is bishop of the Newark, New Jersey Diocese of the American Episcopal Church. In my judgment, no man in my generation has done more damage to the cause of New Testament Christianity than John Shelby Spong. It is interesting that the major talk shows like Phil Donahue and Oprah Winfrey and others have enjoyed having John Shelby Spong on their, on their talk shows. One of the reasons is he supports every kind of sexual aberration that you can mention. For example, he says every church must have some kind of ceremony celebrating young people's getting together and living together without being married. They also must recognize and honor the men and women who choose to live with the same sex, not in a marriage relationship, because he says not, that's not really marriage. But this is what churches must do, and that's what Bishop Spong does. That's also what a number of other Episcopal priests have done. Let me read just a few statements to you. John Shelby Spong has written a book he calls Into the Whirlwind, The Future of the Church. Just a few statements. He claims to identify three frontiers in this book. The first one is the relativity of all truth. Except that one. He says all truth is relative except the idea that all truth is relative. Number two, the revolution in sexual understanding. And one of his books is called A Bishop Rethinks Human Sexuality. And he is saying that the Bible is prejudiced and bigoted with respect to certain forms of sexual expression. The third is the emerging of the human consciousness that transcends tribal identity. That may sound good, but when you investigate, he means across all national and state boundaries. And he also means that Christians who claim exclusiveness for Christianity are, of course, in, the, in error. Bishop Spong refers to the Bible as the paper pope of Protestantism. He argues that ultimate authority can never reside in the assumption of an inerrant Bible. We do not have an inerrant Bible, he says, that is one that has no mistakes. We cannot take comfort and hope in an inerrant Bible. It is honoring the Bible and making a pope out of it, just as the Catholic Church does the pope in the city of Rome. In 1988, Bishop Spong wrote a book he called Living in Sin, and that has a question mark behind it. Can you live in sin? And the subtitle is A Bishop Rethinks Sexuality. Just a statement or two from Bishop Spong in this book. The Bible is a major source feeding the ethical decision-making of Christian people, and its message must be taken with utmost seriousness. But the Bible itself is not free of contradictions, expressions of prejudice, and of attitudes that have long been abandoned. It is not free of contradictions. It has attitudes as C.S. Lewis would have said, which are sub-Christian. Now, if that's true, the Bible is full of contradictions and expresses sub-Christian attitudes, then pray tell me why we ought to take it seriously in making decisions. One more statement from that book. The claim to inerrancy, and as many of you know, this is a major controversy in the field of religion. Right now among the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, and tomorrow, 
and I'm not a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I'm saying tomorrow among churches of Christ, if it's not already true, claims of the inerrancy of Scripture have, lo have long been dismissed in academic circles and in theological circles. So what is the news? All of God's book has been rejected in some academic circles and in some theological circles. What does that prove? These claims remain alive only through the insecurity of Christians who are more concerned with maintaining ecclesiastical power and authority than they are in discerning the truth. The only reason we hold to the inerrancy or the infallibility of Scripture is because of our insecurity. We are afraid we will lose some of our power. The Bible is not infallible. It is not inerrant. He has another book which I shall not refer to except to mention and is called Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism. But one final statement from Bishop Spong. His newest book is called Resurrection, Myth or Reality? Does Christianity depend on a grave that was empty? Now think of the question and how serious the question is. Does Christianity depend on a grave that is empty? on a body that has been resuscitated, on angels that descend in earthquakes and roll massive stones away from the mouth of a tomb, or on a figure who can disappear into thin air after the breaking of bread. Does Christianity depend on these? And my answer is yes. A thousand times yes. Paul said without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. There is no hope, and we are of all men most miserable. The men from whom I have quoted tonight, H.J. Blackham, Bishop Spong, are all evolutionists. Evolution probably has done more damage to New Testament Christianity, to people's hope for the future, than any other theory ever propounded by the fertile mind of human beings. If we are just animals... And that's what every theory of evolution says. Then what are we except animals with no hope, no future, and no meaning? If the evolutionists are right, men do not belong to the special creation that we've been talking about. We do not belong to God Almighty because there is no God. We are brothers of the beasts of the field and nothing more. The evolutionary view has led to pessimism and nihilism, which means extinction and no meaning. These words from Paul Gauguin, who was the famous post-impressionist painter, I think puts all of this in proper perspective. These are his words. Whence come we? What are we? Whither do we go? Those are great questions. And every gospel preacher has spent many years in talking about these, in telling people about our origin and our duty and our destiny. But here are his answers. He says, we come from nowhere. We are nothing. And we are going nowhere. Dr. James Bales, a number of years ago, wrote two excellent books that need to be read in connection with a, with a theme such as the one I'm discussing with you tonight. One he co-authored with Dr. Robert Clark entitled, Why Scientists Accept Evolution. Excellent book. In 1951, he wrote a book called Atheism's Faith and Fruits. I want to read one statement. Dr. Bales quotes these words from... Now, Walter Lippmann, Walter Lippmann was a famous American writer, newspaper man. He wrote a book called A Preface to Morals, which I was fortunate to buy a few years ago. Lippmann was an atheist, and he says, we atheists, we secular humanists, we unbelievers, have no God to worry about, no future to be concerned about, so there really ought not to be any worries of any kind. But then he adds... These are the prisoners who have been released. They ought to be happy. They ought to be serene and composed. They are free to make their own lives. 
There are no conventions, no taboos, no gods, priests, princes, fathers, or revelations which they must accept. Yet the result is not so good as they thought it would be. The prison door is wide open. They stagger out in the trackless space under a blinding sun. They find it nerve-wracking. Where is my home? cried Nietzsche. For it do I ask and seek and have sought, but have not found it. O oh, eternal everywhere. O oh, eternal nowhere. O oh, eternal in vain. That's the theme of atheism, agnosticism, and other forms of unbelief. The great truth of God's word, and this forms the basis of everything that follows from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, is that man is created in the image of God, not in the image of lizards or apes or bacteria. We are of divine origin. Oh, I know, we seldom act like that, but there is no question about the truth of God's word. We are made in God's image. God the Father said to the other members of the Godhead in Genesis 1, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. We can understand the significance of being created in the image of God when we read statements like these, and this is Genesis 5.3. And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image, and he called his name Seth. It is also significant in modern times when so many people are opposing the death penalty to realize that God instituted the death penalty because God's image resides in man. Whoso sheds man's blood, Genesis 9, 6 says, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God he made man. I read a few minutes ago from Colin Chapman's book, Christianity on Trial. Let me read just a statement or two with regard to man's image from this splendid book. Since we are created in the image of God, we must have some of the same attributes of our creator. We are not omnipotent. We are not all powerful. We're not all wise. We cannot be everywhere at the same time as God is. We are not all good. In spite of what Shirley MacLaine says, you know, Shirley says we are God. She says she is. I happen to know better, but at least that's what many of the New Age people are saying. And then he responds to, by saying, to say that man is like God means that just as God is personal, so man is personal. Just as God has a mind and can think and communicate, so man has a mind and can think and communicate. He is rational. Just as God has will and can decide and make free choices, so man has a will and can make certain free choices. He is responsible and accountable. Just as God has emotions and can feel, so man has emotions and can feel. There are other areas of similarity between finite man and infinite God, but I'm sure you have read the Bible enough to know what these are. Love, for example, is worth thinking about. The Bible teaches, and part of our topic tonight is involved in this, that we are made in God's image, but our bodies are also fearfully and wonderfully made. There is no passage in all of God's word that makes that truth more beautiful and more impressive than Psalm 139, from which I shall read very shortly. If either organic evolution or theistic evolution or saltationism is true, and I'll explain saltationism in just a moment, that man, then man is the naked ape, and that's what Desmond Morris, Morris called human being. We're naked apes. Or he's the human animal, as Phil Donahue says. 
Saltationism says that evolution did not take place gradually. It was by major jumps. Sometimes it's called hopeful monsters. A lizard lays an egg to give you a simple illustration, and when it hatches, a bird flies off. The organic, uh, organic evolutionists say it takes hundreds of years or thousands of years to go from the lizard to the bird. Dr. Stephen Jay Gould at Harvard and Goldschmidt and others say it's one big jump. Of course, they've never seen that happen. They do not know any examples of it, but they've proved that organic evolution and theistic evolution are false, so they've got to come up with a new theory. And that's the latest one, saltationism. But all of these theories are false and fortunately are coming under greater criticism in 1993 and 4 and 5 than ever in my lifetime. I want to give you just one or two examples. Dr. Michael Denton, who is a physician from Australia and a molecular biologist, has written an absolutely devastating critique of the theory of evolution and is called Evolution, a Theory in Crisis. One statement from this outstanding physician and researcher who's still an evolutionist and that I have problems explaining. Ultimately, Dr. Denton says, the Darwinian, Darwinian theory is no more or less than the greatest cosmogenic myth of the 20th century. It is a myth, but he still believes it. I've given you another example in the manuscript in the book Dr. Colin Patterson, who is senior paleontologist at the British Museum in London, and a paleontologist is a man who studies fossils. He's an expert in fossils. He was making a speech to a group of scientists, and he said to them, I waked up this morning, or a few mornings ago, and I had decided during the night something happened that I have decided I know nothing, absolutely nothing, about evolution. And I've been studying it 20 years. And he said to the scientists in the office, do any of you know anything, one thing, about evolution? And not a one of them responded. They did not know anything. He also said, I believe that evolution not only does not provide knowledge, it provides anti-knowledge. Dr. Philip Johnson interviewed this famous paleontologist in Britain and asked him if he had said these things and he said yes he had said them but he still said I do not know how to explain some things without the theory of evolution but evolution is under attack without any doubt whatsoever and I have listed in the bibliography two of the greatest books in my judgment ever written on the topic other than the Bible and they're written by Wendell Bird and you need to look them up and buy them. They're expensive, but they're worth their weight in gold if you're concerned about evolution. As we have said, man's body is fearfully and wonderfully made. I want to spend just a few minutes talking about what is commonly called the design argument. And I know Dave Miller has probably preached on that in this group and perhaps some others have. It's not new by any means. It goes back for a long, long time. In fact, it goes back to the Bible, not in the form of a formal argument, but at least in the form of some affirmations, which I'll read to you. Archbishop, Archdeacon rather, William Paley of the Church of England popularized what is called the design argument or the teleological argument, if you want a big name for it. The word telos means end. And what he was saying was that there, are, there is design in the universe. There are ends and goals which prove there had to be a designer. His argument is stronger today than ever for the simple reason we know more about the human body, its functions, its complexity, than any other generation has ever known. And the more we know, the more we ought to be impressed with the fact that God is behind this wonderful body that he's given us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Dr. Terry Meathy, who's a Christian church preacher, and Dr. Gary Habermas wrote an excellent book entitled, Why Believe? That's a question, and the answer is God exists. That's the reason you believe, because God exists. 
And they say that the universe is either an accident or planned. And that really leaves very little middle ground. The, the, the universe, and that includes us, is either an accident or it was planned. And they insist it was not an accident. It could not be an accident. And I'll give you some examples in just a moment of how impossible it would be for our bodies to exist and to operate by chance or by accident. A. Cressy Morrison in the 1940s wrote a little book, which I wish were still in, a, in publication, entitled Man Does Not Stand Alone. Dr. Morrison at the time was president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in this little book of about 110 pages, he gives example after example of design in the universe, most of them from the, the starry heavens, a few from the animal world, and very few from a human existence. But the book is worth its weight in gold, and I wish I had a copy of it for each of you. Merlin Grant Smith, a mathematician and astronomer, quotes Immanuel Kant, the famous German philosopher, as saying, Two things fill me constantly with increasing admiration and awe the longer and the more earnestly I reflect upon them. And here are the two things that fill this man with wonder, the starry heaven above and the moral law within. And I ask you how to explain either by the process of, of naturalistic evolution. As I mentioned a moment ago, the Bible does not present a formal argument for God's existence. The kind that a philosopher would produce, like Dr. Tom Warren, for example, in our generation. But the Bible does affirm that you can look at the world, and you can even look at the human body, and you can see the hand of God in all of this. Two passages. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out throughout the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit under the ends of it. There is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. In Romans 1, Paul describes conditions among Gentiles in the first century. It really is one of the most discouraging chapters in all of God's book when you think of the behavior, the abominable conduct of human beings. But listen to these words from Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, literally hold down, or suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. Because that which is known of God is manifest in them. And a better translation probably would be, can be known by them. For God has shown it to them. When man looks about, observes the universe, including his body, then he ought to know that this could not have happened accidentally. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. If a man does not see God in the starry sky above, in the existence of human being, in the birth of a baby, then he is without excuse. They glorified when they knew not God, they glorified, or when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. But they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. When you look around and see the evil abounding in the United States, you wonder if we have not reached, at least in some areas, the same depth of degradation that characterized the people in Rome. Bertrand Russell, the famous English agnostic and critic, an abrasive type human being, and extremely immoral, the famous agnostic was once asked, what if you get to heaven and you go before God in a judgment, 
What are you going to say to him? Here is a man who had become famous or infamous, depending on your viewpoint, as a critic of God, as a non-believer. He wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Christian, along with a number of other books. What are you going to say to God? And he said, I will tell him that he did not give me enough evidence. Paul said, when a man looks around and sees the world and does not believe in God, he is without excuse. That's where Bertrand Russell is, without excuse. Psalm 139, and I suspect somebody will be talking about this during this lectureship, so I will read only a few words and make some suggestions with regard to some reading. The Lord said, for thou hast possessed my reins. This is Psalm 139, 13 and 14. That expression reins means my inward parts. Thou hast possessed my inward parts. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I hope you noticed in that reading, and I'm sure you've read it before, that the psalmist was a person before he was born. Notice the personal pronouns. My reigns covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that my soul knows right well. If he were not a person and just a parasite, as Joseph Fletcher calls babies in their mother's womb, how could he use that kind of language? I want to recommend three books. I'm not going to have time to discuss them with you, but they, like some others I have mentioned, are of tremendous importance. Dr. Paul Brand, who spent many years working as a missionary for the Baptist Church in Valori, India, and is the leading expert in the world on Hansen's disease, leprosy, along with Philip Yancey, wrote three books, all of still available, one called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, A Surgeon Looks at the Human and Spiritual Body. The second is called In His Image, and the third in 1994, Pain, the Gift Nobody Wants. Dr. Brand says the very existence of pain is evidence there is a God. What if you could not feel pain? We would destroy ourselves. I, in the book, I have given you some examples, particularly the human eye the cells, and the human body. I want to use another one tonight. Dr. Mark Cosgrove, a young psychologist, PhD in psychology from Purdue, wrote a book a few years ago he called The Amazing Body Human, God's Design for Personhood. These are just a few extracts from his book. There is probably nothing to be found in the universe that is more complicated than the human brain. I want you to think about that now, the human brain more complicated than we can even imagine. The charmed cell in the brain is the neuron, whose exact numbers are difficult to calculate. But 10 billion is an often quoted figure. The actual number may be 10 times that high. 10 billion neurons in the human brain. As small as the brains are, brain neurons stretched end to end would reach to the moon and back again. And that by accident? And there is more, but let me quote from another book. Dr. Richard Restock has a book called The Brain, The Last Frontier. And he says the corpus callosum, which is the part of the brain that collects the right, uh, connects the right and the left hemisphere, that the corpus callosum is carrying something like four billion impulses a second as you listen to this speech tonight. Four billion impulses a second. And yet Dr. Restack is an evolutionist. How could you explain, and I'm just asking you this, the human reproductive system if evolution were true? How can you explain the respiratory system, the circulatory system, the human eye, the skin of human beings, and I have used that as an illustration in the lectureship book as well. Now let me summarize briefly by telling you some of the implications of the fact that we belong to God 
because he made us. We're going to give an account before him in the judgment because we are accountable to him. Here are some implications very briefly. If all men are created in the image of God, discrimination based on race or color or national origin is sinful and inexcusable. And yet, even among churches of Christ, there is still some discrimination against poor people or people of other races or nationalities that is not justified on any basis from a scriptural viewpoint. Number two, mistreatment of one's fellow man, one's wife, one's children, one's neighbor, is inherently immoral. But you tell me how it would be immoral. On what basis? If we are descendants of the apes or ascendants, depending on whether we're looking from a human viewpoint or the monkey's viewpoint. <laughs> the Supreme Court of Virginia upheld a Virginia statute requiring the sterilization of a young mother who had given birth to a feeble-minded child. The child scored a mental age of nine on the Stanford Binet intelligence test. The mother tested at the mental age of seven. Justice Wendell, Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of America's most respected jurists, wrote as follows in the United States Supreme Court's decision agreeing with the Virginia law that the mother should be sterilized because we don't want people like that. And these are his words. We have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the citizens, the very best citizens, for their lives. It would be strange indeed if we could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Now, in case you're wondering how a man could make that kind of statement, let me read another statement from Justice Holmes. He says that he sees no difference between uh, is significance of any kind between that which belongs to a baboon or a man or a grain of sand. What else could an evolutionist say? I recently did a radio sermon on the topic, The Baby's Pond. Dr. John Whitehead's book, Religious Apartheid, The Separation of Religion from American Public Life, gives this story. A Christian missionary to China, went into the city of Amoy some 32 years ago, and this would have been in the 1800s. There was a pond in the middle of town, and floating on this pond were the bodies of little babies. Their mothers did not want them. And this missionary said every day you could walk by the center of town and see these babies' bodies, and nobody looked on without, with surprise. They weren't surprised. Do we have babies' ponds in the United States because we do not believe we're created in the image of God? If you believe you're created in the image of God and God is going to hold you responsible for obedience to his will and you're not a Christian tonight, you have the opportunity and the obligation to respond in faith and obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe Christ is the Son of God, Will you not stand before this good audience and before God and confess, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon that confession, be baptized into Christ. If you've started and you've turned aside and become unfaithful, he wants you to come back. We want you to come back. You have the opportunity right now as we stand and sing. Will you come? What is